Hi there, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Podcast. On today's podcast, we're talking about how hormones influence your skin health. My guest is Naomi Judge, who has a bachelor's degree in health science and is a nutritionist, blogger, and author in Sydney, Australia. Naomi is known in Australia for her expertise in supporting women who are frustrated, fed up, and struggling with unresolved hormonal health problems. Naomi helps these women connect the dots between their health, happiness, and hormones, enabling them to live a life of optimal vibrancy, which she calls your new normal. And I know it's nice to have a different perspective on, on women's health and hormones, and it's nice to see how things might be a little bit different in Australia and how a practitioner there uses different wording, a different, slightly different approach, but there's a lot of similarity on some of the things that we hear me talking about as, as far as hormonal balance. And on today's podcast, we discuss how hormones such as progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone impact our skin as women. And Naomi shares her top tips for balancing hormones through diet and lifestyle. So please enjoy this interview. Naomi, it's so great to have you on the Spa Doctor podcast. Welcome. Oh, thank you. So great to be here. Yeah, so today we're talking about hormones and how they show up on the skin, and specifically sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And so you see certain things in, when you're working with your clients, you see certain patterns that show up on the skin, right? That's right. And it's, it's quite interesting because they are these patterns and they're quite, like for some women, they can be cyclic. And that's what can make it confusing. I mean, just all sorts of patterns like, you know, puffiness on the face, blackheads, um, even acne coming up, um, the skin eczema, psoriasis, the skin looking drier. This can happen. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be there all the time. It can happen through the menstrual cycle, which is, which is quite fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's break it down by hormone. So mm -hmm. let's talk about progesterone and how that plays a role. Yeah, so progesterone, I mean, in, in terms of progesterone, it helps, it, it helps you to feel good. Um, it's a female sex hormone. It regulates your ovulation. So um, when you're mid-cycle and you ovulate, uh, the egg, um, the oocyte then produces progesterone through that kind of second half of your cycle called the luteal phase. And as progesterone rises... Um, and estrogen at that time, but progesterone helps to make your skin feel kind of that more supple, like it's um, a little bit, you know, it looks, it looks brighter, a little bit like a pregnant lady. You know, when, when women are pregnant, they kind of have that brightness, mm -hmm. you know, and what's interesting, I find fascinating is, is that kind of brightness in the eyes as well. So everything kind of brightens up, gets, gets nice and moist. Um, progesterone helps to sort of send blood everywhere as well. And um, if that's not happening during that kind of later half of the phase, all sorts of things can happen. And, and one of the things that progesterone is responsible for is it does regulate aldosterone, which helps to regulate the fluid in and out of the cells. And one of the things I find progesterone is responsible for if it's too low, particularly in that second half of the cycle, is that sort of water retention and puffiness you know, waking up in the morning and having the puffy eyes or the puffy face. And I see that's one sign of that low progesterone. But if progesterone's going well, the hair will feel good during that phase, the skin will feel good, you'll feel nice and relaxed and, and just that kind of calm energy. Right. And so, I mean, I, progesterone is one of the things, like you said, it can change in the cycle. It also changes as we, as we get older too, as we age as women, uh, it will start to, to, to go down, especially in relationship to estrogen. A lot of the symptoms that early pre sort of premenopausal kind of symptoms come from that, that drop in progesterone in relationship to estrogen, right? Oh, that's so right. I mean, progesterone, it's, it's a very sensitive hormone and I do a lot of tests on my clients and it's very rare that I see progesterone too high or in that optimal range. I mean, I would say 2% of my clients have really high progesterone and that's maybe because they've got polycystic ovarian syndrome or something going on. But um, with the progesterone, it's so sensitive. It's so sensitive to insulin and sugars. So with high insulin and hyperinsulinemia, where, where we have, can't control our blood sugar, progesterone tends to funnel um, into testosterone. So then you have that more testosterone or it funnels into estrogen and then estrogen rises. 
Or as we go through life and we're not managing our stress levels, um, day-to-day stress levels, just little things, or, or we've got chronic illness or inflammation, what progesterone can do is it can kind of funnel down into cortisol. So we end up, as we, as we age, not only the natural aging of our, progester- of our progesterone under functioning, but we end up with this crazy balance of high estrogen and then maybe even high cortisol as well. Yeah, and it's really it's really because it's all a balance, and um, and the, the the way that they work in relationship to each other, each other. So it's more like a relatively high when compared to what it, you know what progesterone is and how those kind of changes. It's so you know, and it's it's a bit complicated, and um, certainly can vary from one woman to the other. Does very well from one woman to the other. And a lot of that has to do with genetics and then also lifestyle. So we'll be, you know, we will definitely want to talk about uh, what we could do to kind of help balance our hormones. But before we do that, what are some of the signs? I mean, I, mean, I would say um, if, you know, if we're looking at that more common thing of, of you know, uh, low progesterone in relationship to estrogen, what are some of the signs of, of that imbalance with estrogen? Yes, yeah, so with, with the elevated um, estrogen, you'll see, um, again, you might see um, flare-ups through the cycle. So one of the things I see is, is that dryness and the eczema in particular. So, so estrogen can be um, inflammatory and it can kind of open up the, um, the blood vessels, the small blood vessels on the skin. So you, can, you might see more of a redness in the face and, and, and flare-ups of eczema. And another thing that I see is particularly if you've got low minerals, um, you know, low zinc or low selenium or um, high insulin, what you might also see is, is the estrogen converting to testosterone as well. So you've got this crazy thing going on then, estrogen's converting to testosterone. And um, so you're getting the maybe blackheads and you're getting acne and conditions like that with the estrogen. Now, now typically um, with estrogen, you'll, you'll, you'll get that, um, heavy painful periods you might get in that second phase of your cycle in the luteal phase you might get more anxiety um you might get things um like hair loss and also that pmt as well you know that that where you get irritated quick to anger because you haven't got that progesterone to buffer you and kind of calm you down and progesterone helps with the serotonin as well so a lot of women might get the depression as well in that kind of second half of their cycle as well as the physical skin signs Okay, and then things like like rosacea or some redness and irritation, things like that on the skin. What about signs like that? Yeah, so um, redness is a big one, and actually that's one that I had a lot from a young age. So very, very, you know, naturally I've got kind of open veins on my cheeks anyway, but I was always very, very red, and it wasn't until I started to balance my hormones in my mid-teens, later than that, that my skin kind of calmed down a little bit. So um, estrogen tends to open up the veins um, on the skin, and so blood will rush out. And not only that, it will it will cause a little bit of inflammation on the skin. So rosacea is one of those conditions where um, you have that inflammation, and also it can turn into bacterial. What's interesting as well with the redness and the rosacea is um, estrogen can, estrogen feeds, it can feed bacteria and also fungi like candida. And so if your condition is related to also more bacteria in the gut or candida, that will come out on the skin as well. So you might see more little pustules and, and more spots. But what's interesting is, is what I've noticed with my clients is things like rosacea and the redness will be cyclic so sometimes that they'll feel fine through the month and then they'll notice for a few days it gets it gets a lot worse as that estrogen is rising and the progesterone doesn't kind of buffer it they get that more inflammation on the skin with the redness the flushing um, the rosacea um, the permeability of the veins also um, increases so you get that kind of you can get that blood leakage as well Right. And so, and then the converse of that is when estrogen goes low, then we have a decrease in that vasculature, blood, the blood flow. And so then we start to see as, you know, as women get closer to menopause and beyond, there's a tendency to look more pale, right? Because that, that of that decreased blood flow. Um, so things like rosacea may not be as bad, 
Uh, but then there might be a feeling like, oh, my skin looks more dull or just not as, I don't have that flushed look that I used to have when I was younger is what some people will say. Would you agree? Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And, it, and it's interesting. You can see it through your lifespan. So, you know, your perimenopause or menopausal, but again, you can see it through your cycle. And even I see that as well. So as soon as my period comes and my hormones drop out, I can just feel the skin. It's that kind of dullness and even the texture of the skin because the, the estrogen and progesterone both kind of help with the fibroblasts and the collagen tissue in the skin, you know, to help just to plump it up. And I notice even that, this is crazy, but even that changes when my hormones drop out a little bit during my menstrual cycle. So just pale and you wake up in the morning and you just think my skin, it looks that less, doesn't pop back, you know, pop back into place. And then later on in the cycle, you're like, wow, I've, my skin's amazing. It's just, it's, it's, I find it fascinating how it can change so quickly, but definitely that perimenopause, menopausal state where the where hormones are lowering, you'll you're notice it a lot more there. And I think that, what what's going on in your 20s and 30s is kind of a warning sign as to what your skin will look like you know later on in your late 40s 50s 60s that's a really good point and i think a lot of people aren't as observant as you are most people are <laughs> notice it but because you work with people on this and you you have a, a deeper understanding of hormones then you kind of know what to look for so it's interesting for other for people listening watching i would say you know start paying attention to this and see if you notice changes for yourself and certainly there are things that we can do the earlier we start to balance our hormones, the better. It's never too late, even if you're already past menopause and you're you're trying to figure out what you know what more you could do. It's never too late, but the earlier you start, the better it, it is, right? So let's. And the key here that we're talking about is balance. So just because it's your if your estrogen is low, for example, doesn't mean you should go on estrogen. Um, it, it means that you want to create balance. Is that you want to help support your body in making its own um, uh, homeostasis of wherever you are in your life, the different stages of life and phases of your cycle and your um, and your age that you you're optimizing your body right to create that balance couldn't be couldn't have said it better that's exactly right it's that balance and i think we get caught up um when we learn things that, you know oh more is more is better kind of thing and less is less is better if we think it's bad but there is that beautiful balance and we need estrogen we need progesterone and we need testosterone but in that wonderful balance where it just works for us right and then with testosterone one of the things that I noticed is that with testosterone decreasing um, after menopause is that, that testosterone or around menopause is that testosterone helps us maintain our muscle. So when we lose muscle throughout our body, including our face, that's when part of we'll, we'll notice more of the, the loose skin and like, mm -hmm. because there's less of the muscles to really, to hold that up. Is that, do you notice that as well? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. The testosterone does help with that because that, that's that, yeah, t totally um, helps with the muscle. And, and most likely, I would say it helps with um, the connective tissue as well. Um, there is there is something there where it helps. I know estrogen does, but I suspect testosterone helps with that connective tissue. I know um, genetically in my family, the women have high testosterone. And one of the things I've noticed is nobody, no matter what age, has cellulite. Um, so it's kind of a genetic thing, no cellulite, even though there is that estrogen dominance, the testosterone seems to be a protective, I think it protects against cellulite because it keeps um, muscle fibers there, but also the connective tissue. Right. And then on the flip side of that, if you have high androgens, including testosterone, then you might be more prone to to breaking out, especially cystic acne or, you know, more of those, uh, the acne issues, oily skin, enlarged pores, blackheads, whiteheads, those sorts of things, Sean. Oh, totally. I mean, that's, um, yeah, again, that's one thing that I get with that higher testosterone. I'm lucky that I've never had acne, but I get kind of acne's cousin, which is a little bit of congestion and the blackheads just here and that's due to that that kind of elevated testosterone but women will notice that um you know on the cheeks in the beard area um particularly if um the estrogen is converting to testosterone and another thing i've noticed recently with women with higher testosterone and lower estrogen is the graying in this we have a there's a process called aromatase where um the testosterone gets converted to estrogen and that happens 
pre-menopause and post-menopause so that we can continue to make estrogen. So I've noticed that women start graying here where there's a lot of those testosterone aromatase receptors as well. Hmm. Okay. Um, and so when it comes to balancing hormones, to just to that, you know, when it comes to lifestyle and the different ways that we want to balance hormones, starting again, we start as early as possible, right? What are some of the big things that you've noticed with your clients that you felt have helped the most? Okay, so the first thing is just, I mean, it can be so complex. And obviously, there's, a, there's an array of different things you can do to balance. But there are simple things that everybody can can do just from day to day. So one is simple cleansing technique. So what tends to happen is particularly with estrogen dominance, um, we tend to kind of get that backup of estrogen, our gallbladder, our liver and our bowel, just get a little bit um, slow in terms of detoxing estrogen. So just simple techniques like um, dry skin brushing to help with the lymphatic system to help remove estrogen and, and muck from the lymphatics and that will help. Another is actually doing things like infrared saunas. Having said that, I did hear the other day and I haven't looked at studies, I don't know if you've seen any studies, I heard someone say on a podcast that infrared saunas may affect the connective tissue. Now I need to have a look at that study and just see what might be going on. So I'm not sure, but saunas are very good. So I love that kind of physical detoxifying. And then of course, just having the greens. So having your green juices, um, and if you've got any thyroid problems or issues with um, your sulfur rich vegetables like your broccoli, because having about a cup of those a day cooked in a soup is very good to detox estrogen. But if you've got any problems having those and you can't eat those because they get you a bit windy or you've got some thyroid issues, you could do a supplement like sulfurophane and that's beautiful at helping the body detoxify. So that's wonderful. And then also when we're looking at detoxifying, um, helping the gallbladder. So the gallbladder tends to hold on to a lot of the um, fat soluble toxins, but including estrogen. And what I've noticed is women with gallbladder issues or sludgy bile or a slow detoxifying gallbladder, they tend to get, you know, more moles on the skin, maybe more melasma and, and things like that. So what I found helps the gallbladder are two things. So lemon in water or a little bit of apple cider vinegar in water every day on an empty tummy in the morning. And that helps the acetic acid in the apple cider vinegar or the citric acid in the lemon helps to kind of loosen the bile. And I've noticed how doing that, it does brighten the skin up. You can notice after about a week, it helps with the skin. So detoxifying is very, very important. Okay. Well, yeah, certainly in part of detoxification is reducing our exposure to hormone disrupting chemicals and, um, and personal care products and, and food and water and all of that. So of course, right. You know, uh, reducing your overall exposure is Re exactly reducing the load. I mean, plastics is a big one. So just slowly reducing plastics. If you, you know, even just making small baby steps. So if you're drinking from a plastic bottle, just swap it to glass. Um, have a look at, you know, your cookware and things that the, what the food goes in, put it in glass and just swapping things out lightly like that. And it does make a huge difference. So that is the first one. And then the second one is diet in terms of getting a diet that stabilizes you through the day. So a diet that stabilizes your blood sugar, because when blood sugar fluctuates, what that will do is it will change the way the hormones funnel down. So instead of them funneling nice, funneling nice and balanced into progesterone, a bit of testosterone, a bit of estrogen and of course the right estrogens what happens when we don't have a balanced diet is that our hormones go up and down now some diets ketogenic diet suits people some people are vegan diet some people um, um, fasting all those suit people but what I advise women to do first this is really important is just stabilize your diet first so breakfast lunch and dinner a nice blend of macronutrients so that's your protein your fat your carbohydrate in, in forms of um, sweet potato in forms of a little bit bit of basmati rice maybe legumes if you can tolerate them but um, don't go full-on into a diet unless you've stabilized your diet first and you know you've stabilized your blood sugar because if you start fasting or you start adding heaps and heaps of fat you could then get a little bit more of a hormone problem and what I've noticed say with fat is women that tend to be estrogen dominant um, when you start loading your body up with tons and tons of fat it just starts to synthesize more estrogen so you need to get to the root cause and balance your diet first so that's the second thing balancing your diet with beautiful macronutrients yeah, and that's great. And then, of course, on the flip side of that, I mean, I feel like 
the low fat diet phase is kind of on its way out, but I still <laughs> like, or maybe it, technically I would consider it's, it's out, but there's still some people that, that believe that, you know, you want to cut back on fat and, that, and, and of, of course we want to make sure we're eating good fats. And um, I want to make sure people understand that hormones come from cholesterol. And so we need our good fats to help make hormones. So that's just what I, so I know you were talking about high fat, but on the other side of that, you don't want to be low fat either. So it's, it's, oh. it's so important to find that balance. Oh, exactly. And I mean, we've got this whole generation of women really, you know, in their 60s, 70s or 80s that unfortunately went through the low fat fad. And so there's brain issues, there's low cholesterol. And if you've got, like you said, if you've got no cholesterol, you won't have the hormones. So osteoporosis, dementia, Alzheimer's, it's um, a whole, a whole new thing. But hopefully, like you said, that's slowly changing. And women know that, you know, introducing avocado, a little bit of ghee, a little bit of butter, some cold pressed organic olive oil, Oil, a little bit of avocado oil, those beautiful fats, and even coconut oil for some um, can help with the hormones and just general health and skin as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so then fiber, fiber is really important and fiber can be difficult to get if you're following a strict diet. So if you're following ketogenic or if you're following certain diets, sometimes I think we forget about fiber, but getting fiber from our fruits and vegetables. So, you know, not having too much fruit, you, you just want to, you know, if you're, if you like having your fruit, I, I do like having a serve of fruit a day. What I noticed when I didn't have my fruit was I wasn't getting the antioxidants and, and those minerals from fruit. So I have about a serve of fruit a day. Um, and vegetables. So you want to be getting, you know, anything from four to nine <laughs> cups of vegetables a day. That seems a little bit excessive. And the reason I say four is because if I say nine, I think some people will go, what, how, how can I get that in? But you know, there are clever ways you can get it in, you know, having big leafy green salads, having blended soups, you know, once you blend a soup, you've got broccoli or you've got zucchini in there and you blend it up. That's a ton of vegetables. And then of course we've got kind of green smoothies or um, vegetable smoothies. So there's ways to get it in. So just start from where you are. Don't suddenly freak out and think I have one cup a day. Now I've got to have nine, just get your one cup, go to two, go to three and just slowly increase it. And if you do have any issues, say with constipation, you know, cook your vegetables. Um, Cause sometimes the, the extra fiber can, can be a little bit tough. So just lightly do it. Don't go from one to nine tomorrow. <laughs> That's a good tip. <laughs> um, and I think too, it's enough. I think a lot of times people get used to eating the same foods over and over again. Right. And, and I like to encourage people to try different, different vegetables. And uh, if, if nine seems like a lot, well, it doesn't have to be all nine of the same, please <laughs> bring it up some. So it's not just like nine servings of spinach. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mix it up, and and also what we what we've learned about the gut microbiome is when you eat a diverse variety of, of fruits and vegetables, it actually can improve your gut microbiome. So having a diverse group, and so when you said nine, I'm I'm, I'm a lot of people thinking, okay, I got to eat like five servings of celery, and <laughs> you know, uh, it, exactly, yeah, mix, I, mix it up. <laughs> mm, mix it up. I mean, I'm loving and, and just whatever's in season. I mean, at the moment, I'm loving um, asparagus. It's in season over here. And asparagus is full of glutathione. And that's wonderful for detoxifying the liver and supporting the gut. So just kind of go with what's in season. Exactly like you said, go to the markets and, and just see things you're not sure what they are. Pick them up and experiment and play around with these foods because it's actually, it's really fun. I find it relaxing at the end of the day. I mean, I'm not sure, um, not everybody, if you've got a huge family, but um, it's, it's fun to play around with different vegetables. Yeah, and I find that going to the farmer's market's great. And, and I take my kids with me they're a little bit older now, but, but especially when they were younger, when they see where they're coming from, they see all the different variety. I think it's great yeah. education and, and mm. it's a sense of creativity and wanting to try something new. Right? Oh, exactly. I love it. Yeah. Um, so we talked about, okay, so we talked about fiber. We talked about balancing your macronutrient and cleansing. And then number four is earlier, I talked about kind of the stress levels. So in terms of when you, when we get stressed, our body does crazy things. I mean, not only does the cortisol um, affect our skin, so it can actually break down the collagen tissue. So we're more likely to get those kind of fine lines. So that's one thing that's happened. Also, the cortisol can affect the fluid balance in our body as well. So we can get puffy or we can lose muscle fiber, lose muscle mass. 
Um, so we really need to manage that. And you can manage that, you know, the, the best ways, and I know we, everyone says this, I know it's, 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 it's what everyone's talking about at the moment, and it can be a little bit boring for people, but so many people don't do it, is meditation. You know, doing that meditation, resetting each day, even doing the mindfulness through the day. And what I hear from a lot of my clients is, oh, I don't have time to meditate. I hate meditating. I can't meditate. I find it stressful. Um, and those are the people that need it. They need it. And so I, I just try and say, just do a little bit every day. Just say, I'm going to do three minutes. I'm going to do 10 minutes. I'm going to do this every day. And again, it's like going to the gym. It's just exercising your mind. It's training your brain to be able to do that. And you don't have to sit still. It's not about not thinking and it's not about having a blank brain for 10 minutes and that if you thought you failed, it's actually the thinking is part of it. So you think, you, you, you then you notice your thinking and then you just try and stop that thought. And so you don't have to have this blank brain. I think a lot of people think that that's what it's about. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, and I think people should... Yeah, like just like you said about the vegetables, go in it easy. Don't try and do an hour long meditation when you first get started. Just start with some simple breath work, even gratitude. And, um, you know, there are walking meditations too. If you don't sit still well, you can actually walk and yes. just um, walk in, in silence and just kind of take in the, the sounds around you and just go on a nice peaceful walk. That's a form of meditation too. Oh, I absolutely love that. Yeah, walking meditation is great. And and just starting off starting off with an app, I think that's a good way to do. And just mindfulness as well. Um, do you have any favorite apps? Um, so I use, I've been playing around. So I actually love um, Waking Up at the Moment by Sam Harris because he he goes into it and he describes that you don't have to not be, you, you can think, it's all about thinking. So his is great. And then there's some other ones, you know, like um, Buddhify and Calm and Headspace. All of those um, work really well. And they start off very small, you know, a couple of minutes and go up to 10. Some go up to 20 minutes. But yeah, I, I'm loving that waking up app at the moment. I do like that. That's great. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and, then, and then one of the most obvious ones, but I'm not sure everyone's doing it, is sleep. Sleep. Sleep does balance your hormones. It, it helps to balance the estrogen along with the cortisol, along with the melatonin, and gets them all in nice, um, you know, harmony for your body. And if we're not sleeping or we're having really late nights or we're waking up multiple times during the night, that not only increases the cortisol and decreases the mel melatonin, but also that plays havoc with the estrogen and progesterone levels as well. So it's really important. And I know I have seen some studies that women who don't get, you know, have interrupted sleep, but also sleep where there's too much light. So synthetic light, artificial light coming through the window, that is a risk factor for breast cancer as well. So there is that connection. So making sure you've got a darked out room, um, wear an eye mask if you can, um, try and have it at, you know, have a window open if you can. So you've got that nice fresh air or temperature or have, um, a, have a air filtration um, system in the bedroom. So just make it as um, lovely as possible to sleep and try and get try and be in bed you know if, if you're if you're at six go to seven or eight hours if you can if not you know try, get, at least trying to get that six hours is really important um and i've actually just discovered an app that i've been playing around with i don't know if you've seen it um called sonic sleep where um of course have your phones on flight mode because emf and um, Wi-Fi can disrupt your sleep. So make sure you've got everything turned off and have your router set to a timer as well in the house. So that t turns off at night. So you've got the, you've got the house nice for you and the kids and it, everything's turned off. But so, so turn your phone to flight mode, but Sonic Sleep is this app and it plays this kind of white noise and then it changes it through the night. So you kind of get into a deeper sleep. And I tell you, I've been using that and I've been loving it. It's been working nicely for me. Nice. Very nice. And I, and I think that's a great, um, what you mentioned about turning it into, um, I, you called it what, what um, the mode is the airplane flight mode. That's I, it. Airplane mode. I think that's an easy little thing. If you are using your phone for some of the apps, but they don't necessarily need to be connected to the Wi-Fi, and just doing that alone is gonna gonna help with that. Um, those you know those are great tips and fantastic. Any anything else? 
that's it i mean those are those are good good place to get started and 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 just the start this starts that balancing and you know doing that for four even just four to six weeks you start to notice that difference and the t and and the thing that you might see as well um at the end with your next cycle if you start to do this and remove kind of the inflammatory foods you notice that your less in your next period you know it's not as heavy it's not as clotting it's not as painful so you start to notice those symptoms improve as well mm -hmm. absolutely I, and i really think that um when you start with the foundation of um like you're talking about when you're making these these um, adjustments in your diet, in your stress management, all of that really does create this great foundation for your hormones to get into a balanced state. And then if you need additional support, if that's not enough, then you can work with different practitioners that functional medicine or naturopathic physicians that focus on helping you with, with, with balancing hormones and, and taking up a notch with supplements and maybe biogenical hormones. So, well, thank you so much for your interview today. Tell everybody where they can find out more about you. So they can hop onto my website at naomijudge.com or if they're loving videos, uh, my YouTube channel at Naomi Judge and also Facebook, Naturopath Naomi. So there's a ton of um, information on there, free videos, and I, and I go through everything in a lot of detail, so they can find me there. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Naomi, for coming on today. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure being here. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Naomi. And to learn more about her, you can go to thespadoctor.com, go to the podcast page with her interview, and you'll find all the information and links there in the show notes. And while you're there at thespadoctor.com, I encourage you to join our community so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. And if you haven't already taken the skin quiz, it's a great way to find out what messages your skin is trying to tell you about your health, including hormones hormonal imbalances. So just go to theskinquiz.com. It's a free online quiz and gives you great information on some tips, valuable tools to help you with balancing your hormones and other root causes to help you have healthy skin. It's at theskinquiz.com. Also, I invite you to join me on social media. The Spa Doctor is uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. So you can join the conversation there. And I'll see you next time on the Spot Doctor Podcast.